Hello chess friends! With the US Chess Championship currently underway, I thought it would be interesting to take a look back in time to the year 1964 when one young American chess prodigy won the US Chess Championship with a perfect score. Of course, I am talking about the great Bobby Fischer, who at the young age of 20 years old, close to the same age as Hans Niemann, won all 11 of his games against the top players in the United States to retain his U.S. Chess Championship title, which he first won at the age of only 14. Now, had he accomplished this feat today, I guarantee that someone would at least bring up the possibility that he was cheating. Whether or not this idea would gain traction, I don't know. But in 1964, people weren't really worried about cheating. If computers could even play chess at that point, their ability was far below that of even a mediocre human player. So I thought it would be interesting to take a look at these 11 games and see just what it took to win the U.S. Chess Championship title in 1964 with a perfect score. So without any further ado, let's look at the first game, round one. John Mednis has the white pieces against Bobby Fischer playing black. So Mednis begins with e4, e5 from Bobby Fischer, knight to f3, knight c6, bishop c4, bishop c5. Now Mednis goes for his big pawn center with d4, Preparing with c3, knight f6 by Bobby Fischer. Mednis gets d4 in, pawn takes, pawn takes. Fischer delivers a check with the bishop on b4. Mednis blocks with the bishop, bishop takes, knight takes. And now Bobby executes a pretty common opening trick. Knight takes e4. The point is, if Mednis takes the knight, there's d5, forking the bishop and knight, so he's not gonna lose a piece, he gets his piece back. But that's not what Mednis did. Instead of taking that knight, he tries to get tricky with queen to e2. So Bobby just defends his knight, attacks his bishop. Knight takes e4 by Mednis. Now Bobby plays the right move here. He plays castle. He knows he's going to get one of these pieces. He's not worried about it. If you take on c4, then there's this knight to d6 discovered check, and the king's going to have to move, and Bobby won't be able to castle anymore. If you take on e4, then queen takes e4 check, and the best move for Bobby would be to put his queen in the way, and maybe he doesn't want to allow this early simplification of the position. So instead, he just castles and says, you know what, I'm getting one of these pieces. There's nothing you can do about it. Mednis castles on the queen side. Bobby Fischer pins the knight. Mednis attacks the bishop, and then Bobby takes on f3. Mednis plays the best move here. He takes with the pawn, giving himself bad pawns, but this rook now has an open file, potentially, to the black king. So that could be dangerous for Bobby. Bobby takes on c4. This was not the right move. He should have taken on e4, and then after the recapture, knight takes d4, winning a pawn. That knight is pinned to the queen, but it can be defended by c5. Now here, if instead you take with the queen, you're defending this pawn, but then I guess you got something, well, you got this check here for one, and then if the king moves, I don't know, this queen starts to come under fire. So I guess that's not good for white. But anyway, d takes c4, then Mednis takes the pawn on c4. Queen h4 coming out here, going to try to target some of these weak pawns. King b1, just getting the king to a safer square. Queen f4, hitting the f3 pawn. d5 played by, by Mednis, kicking the knight to e5 with an attack on the queen. And now we gobble a pawn. This is now a pass pawn. That is something to be worried about. Rook A to C8 from Bobby. He's not really worried about the queen taking the pawn here because that just gives his rook a route by which to attack the white king. It opens up the file. So Mednis doesn't go for that. He goes queen D6. Okay, then then we have a little back and forth. The rooks are attacking the queen. Black's other rook gets involved. Queen to E7. Now Bobby Fischer gets a little greedy. He takes the pawn on F3. This is not the best move. He should have played h6. And now if white tries to advance this pawn, which is what happened in the game, rook d7, queen is trapped. Okay, so you're going to lose your queen there. That would have been the best move. Instead he takes the pawn. This allows d6. This pawn is getting ominously close to the promotion square. Knight e5 played. Going back where it came from, blocking the queen's defense of the knight here. So black is threatening to take this knight on e4. So Mednis defends, rook d7 attacking the queen. Now, this was not the right move at this point. Mednis goes to g5 with the queen, but could have won the game with rook to d5. Sacrificing the queen, rook takes e7. This is a crazy line the computer found. D takes, 
Okay, now the problem is this rook's coming in here. This is going to end in checkmate. You have to guard this square here, this d8 square. Knight to c6. Okay, it's guarded for the moment, but now knight d6. Now the threat is to push the pawn. It's going to be a checkmate threat, and you just have to take that pawn out. That's the best defense. You're going to have to sacrifice some piece for it. And then white has knight takes a rook. Okay, threatening checkmate again. You have to give your king an escape square. And then after that, we get knight takes e7 with check, and white has too much material. The two rooks compensate for the queen, and then there's an extra knight. So white's just winning here. So Mednus could have delivered a fatal blow to Bobby in round one, if you would have saw that variation. But instead, queen g5, and then we get a trade of queens. We get f6, hitting the knight. And this past pawn is still dangerous, but Bobby is able to defend. Okay, a pair of rooks come off the board. B6 played. Okay, so he's he's going to keep a piece in front of that pawn, and it's going to be okay. The king starts getting closer. The king comes even closer. Okay, the knight's attacked. It moves, and then king d4. The king's get into the game. we got rook e8, forcing the king away from the past pawn. That's never a bad thing. And the rook goes back. And, you know, it's about an equal position, but then... Mednus at this point goes wrong. He plays rook to h7 check. What he should have played was this knight c3 move. And now the rook cannot take the pawn because if this happens in king e5, you're winning this piece. You're winning a piece. You're attacking the rook and the knight at the same time. So that would have been the best thing to do. But this rook h7 check after the king moves, okay, you take the rook, king takes you have to move this knight and you're losing the pawn on d6 and so bobby ends up winning a pawn he goes back okay knight takes here white gets a pawn but then bobby's going to get this other pawn over here he ends up with the extra pawn okay he's advancing his pawns and then at some point Mednus decides to trade off this pawn here he's got his pawn majority over here on the queen side but it's not going anywhere he decides to trade pawns but that's not a good idea because now Fisher ends up with two passed pawns connected, and it's pretty much fatal. So, you know, the pawns just keep advancing, and it's pretty much an easy win. And the game ends here. These pawns are not going to be able to be stopped. These pawns are completely held up. This one pawn is preventing both of these pawns from advancing. So that was round one. Okay, round two. Bobby Fisher has the white pieces this time playing against Larry Evans with black. We got e4, e5, and then Bobby plays f4, which is the closest thing they had to the bong cloud in those days. It was known not to be a great opening at that point, and Evans does get an early advantage. He ends up playing this queen h4 line with check. Bobby's forced to move his king to f1, losing the right to castle, and black is doing better here, but Bobby defends very well. And over the course of the next few moves, is able to eventually equalize the position. A pair of bishops come off the board. Evans attacks with the pawns on the king side there. Bobby counters in the center. Queen goes to d3. Okay, so what ends up happening is White's king is stuck in the center, and Bobby decides to try to get the rook active by playing h4. He wants to open the file since he's got to get his rooks active somehow. Good move by Evans. Doesn't want to allow that. The knight goes to h2. Okay, we get this. And then Bobby finally regains that pawn he sacrificed on move 2. And then Evans goes wrong with queen takes h4. All that does is remove the pawn that was blocking the rook's activity for white. So this just helps Bobby. And he plays king g1 with the threat of a discovered attack once this knight moves since he's protecting the rook. The threat here would be knight takes g4 and the queen can't take because the queen takes, pawn takes, and then you lose your rook. So Evans plays knight to h6, adding some protection to this point. Knight f1, discovered attack on the queen. Queen moves, and now we get the pawn on h5. Okay, so now Bobby's threatening to win another pawn. He could take that knight there and then take this pawn on g4 with check. So rook g8, adding support to that pawn. We get this move here, developing the knight. Rook goes to g6. Knight to f4, attacking the rook. But now you can see the rook comes alive, and the bishop and the rook are converging on this knight. 
This rook is under attack, so the rook has to move. Very dangerous place to put the rook, by the way, on the same diagonal as that bishop, but Bobby can't really take advantage of that yet. He just develops the bishop coolly. Uh, Evans decides to try to get his knight back in the game. Not really very aware of the impending danger. Queen d2. Now there is a threat of like taking here and winning the rook since the queen and the bishop are lined up. So the rook moves back. But now, guess what? Knight f to e2. Where's this knight going? There's three pieces attacking it. You have no safe square. You're going to lose a piece. So Evans ends up losing this piece. And the rest of the game isn't too hard for Bobby being a piece up. Pawns are equal. So there isn't really much more else to say. Bobby just converts his material advantage and wins round two. Okay, round number three. Bobby Fischer's black. Robert Byrne playing the white side. We got d4, knight f6. And we end up with this Grunfeld. All pretty standard stuff. So there's not a lot to say. Both sides are playing well, but Stockfish says that Fisher is starting to get a bit of an advantage here. And we end up with this move e5 by Fisher. He gets the isolated pawn, but he's not worried about it. He knows he's going to be just fine. He's got the knight coming into d3. Now, Robert Byrne plays the wrong rook move here. He plays rook f to d1. He should have played rook a to d1. There's a clue for you. But after rook f to d1, knight to d3, Okay, and then he plays his queen over here, looking to take that knight out with his rook, get two minor pieces for the rook, and here Bobby Fischer executes probably his most brilliant move yet in this tournament. If you haven't seen this game before, see if you can spot Bobby Fischer's brilliant move. Knight takes f2. If the other rook had been moved to d1 instead of this rook, it would have been fine, because the rook would be here, it could take the knight. But here you gotta take with the king which is what Robert Byrne does. Now we got knight to g4 check. King goes to g1. If you move the king this way, it's not gonna work. This is gonna end in a checkmate. Rook takes h3. You can get the knight, but then h5 check. King goes here, and then the bishop gets involved. That's checkmate. So, Byrne moves his king back to g1. Now we got knight takes e3, forking the queen and rook. Okay, queen moves to d2. Now I think a lot of lesser players would go for knight takes d1 here, right? And the computer says the position's about equal here. But Bobby, he plays the winning move. Knight takes g2. Now it makes me wonder if he saw this far when he took the pawn on f2. I don't know, but he's playing brilliantly. King takes g2, d4. Opening up the diagonal for the bishop to start an attack on the weak white king. White's completely lost here. Knight takes d4 played by Burn. Bishop b7 check. King goes to f1. If you try g1, there's bishop takes d4 check, the queen takes, then the rook comes in here. You take that rook, you're losing your queen. That's not what you want to do. If you just move the king then, well now queen takes here, and then the rook takes over here, and it looks like black is going to win this. Being the exchange up, and having an extra pawn it looks like, so King f1 was played, then we got queen d7, and on move 21, Robert Byrne resigns, because there's no good way to deal with the threat, which is, if black was to have another move, queen h3 check, king goes here, bishop takes here, drawing the queen away from de the defense of g2, queen g2 mate. Um, I don't know if this resignation was a little early. I mean, the computer says white's totally lost, so I guess Robert Burns saw everything that was significant. You can hang on with, like, king g1, queen comes in here, and then you try to get the knight out of the way, like play knight b to d5 so there's no bishop takes knight. But after this move, the queen starts to get attacked, and the queen has to keep defending g2 or there's going to be a checkmate, and the queen just can't stay there. If you go here, there's just going to be bishop e3 check, and that's checkmate, so if you try to go here, it doesn't matter, bishop e3 anyway, and the queen would have to sacrifice herself because you cannot take protection off of g2 or else there's a checkmate. So, brilliant performance by Bobby Fischer. Round number four, Bobby Fischer with white against Bizguire. I'm not sure how to say that, but this guy's playing black. 
And we have a Rui Lopez. Very standard opening theory for quite a few moves. So I'll just uh, go through these quickly till we get to an interesting moment where mistakes start to be made. We have this knight to h5 move by Bizguire looking to hop into f4. This is not accurate. The computer says just develop your bishop with e6. But after knight to h5, Bobby puts a stop to it with g3. g6. And now we get h4. Let's get to this next point where a mistake is made. This move is not so obvious that it's a mistake. f6. Looks reasonable. You're strengthening e5, right? Well, this actually allows Bobby to put the knight to d5. The point is, this diagonal is now weak. Black would love to take out this knight and win a pawn with the rook, but there's too much danger along this diagonal here. So he doesn't do it. He plays queen to b7 instead back here. But let's see what happens if he does win that pawn. I don't know what Bobby was planning here or what Bizguire was worried about, but the computer says that the best move is a4, attacking this pawn. You move that pawn forward, guess what? The bishop's going to pin your rook. This doesn't help. You just take it. You're losing the exchange at least. So you have to defend that pawn with rook b8. So we take, take, and then c4 is the move, attacking the rook, attacking this pawn. If you take that pawn, it's no good. You're in trouble. The rook's pinned, and then this bishop can come here, do something like that. So you don't want to take that pawn on c4, but that just means you're probably going to lose a pawn. So maybe that's what both players were looking at. I don't know, or something else. But queen b7 was played instead. So now Bobby just gets to keep his knight there for a the moment, but he doesn't. He takes out the bishop right away on e7. Queen takes e7. Um, Bobby next goes knight to h2, and he's going to come to g4 and attack on f6. Okay, yeah, he does this. So we get c4, the queen. All right, so f6 is attacked here. If you play f5, you fail because e takes f5, pawn takes, and then after the knight delivers a check, there was a discovered attack on that knight on c6. See, when you took this pawn here. That's why that doesn't work. So how are you going to defend this pawn? You're going to take out the knight on g4. That's what Bizguire does. Bobby takes on g4. And then knight to e6 is apparently not good. Queen to e6 would have been better, challenging the queen. But after knight to e6, we got h5. He's looking to win a pawn there. So, you know, the king moves out of the way. Bobby goes king to g2. He's going to put a rook here, I think, and then look to trade these pawns and open up the file g5 okay so that idea is shut down now bobby just plays bishop to e3 okay so knight to f4 check this is a little bit tricky you can't take the knight well you can but it's not good because now your bishop is attacked and if you move your bishop this will pin the queen to the king bobby's not going to fall for that trick instead he just moves his king out of the way so taking this knight with the pawn is now a threat the knight gets the hop to d3 bobby takes it out and black gets a nice pass pawn uh, that's a little scary, but Bobby knows he can deal with it. He puts a rook in front of it. Rook to d7. So he wants to double his rooks behind his passed pawn. Bobby plays rook d2, preventing the pawn from moving forward. And now, if black is to double his rooks, that rook cannot stay there because there's this bishop b6 move. That's what Bobby will play, most likely. So knight to a5 is played instead, looking to come into c4 and hopefully eliminate that bishop, maybe. Bobby prevents that move with b3, and now the rook cannot go here. If you play the rook here, bishop b6, and you're going to win something. So, and white's just going to double the rooks behind the pawn, so Bizguire decides to defend the pawn with this queen, and after rook a to d1, he puts the rook here, and there's no way to stop rook takes d3. And then he plays queen takes d3, looking to get two rooks for the queen, hoping for something like this and this. Um, that's not even what Bobby does, though. He takes on d7 instead. His queen takes, rook takes. And now Bobby has what? An extra pawn with this super active rook. And how are you going to get your knight back in the game? It's not easy. D rook d6 could just be played. Yeah, black is so passive here. You move that knight, you're going to lose the pawn. So yeah, at this point... Black resigned. And that's the fourth win for Bobby Fischer. Let's go on to round five.
Okay, here we go with round five. Samuel Ryshevsky playing white. Fisher has black. I believe Ryshevsky was a former U.S. champion. So I'm going to go through these moves quickly. I think it's mostly theory. Bobby Fisher's not afraid of the isolated pawn. We get a situation where white gets a weakened pawn. Weak c3 pawn, which Fisher is quick to target with rook to c8. Counterattack on the open b file by Ryshevsky. Fisher stops rook takes b7 by moving his pawn forward. Now this pawn here is targeted, and we get queen to e7. Now a4, not taking on d5, or else the a pawn will fall. So a4 is protecting against that. Now bishop e6, defending that pawn. Queen to a1 is played by Ryshevsky, adding some support to c3. I guess that's the safest square for the queen. If you just go queen d2, then maybe knight a5, looking to come into c4, hitting the queen. I, I don't know. That's an odd-looking move. But it's also supporting pushing this pawn forward. I think that's the point of it, too. Queen to f6, adding more pressure to that point. King g2, just adding protection to that knight on f3. Knight a5, looking to come into c4 now. But actually, no, knight b7. Bobby has an, a different plan. It looked I thought he was going to c4 when I saw this game, but he wants to go to d6, and he's going to end up planting his knight on e4. He wants to win that c3 pawn. So Ryshevsky's able to trade off his weak a pawn, at least. And then he plays queen to b2, targeting this pawn here. If you try to defend this pawn on c3, there's knight d2 with the fork of the rooks. So you have to counterattack there and lose your c pawn. Okay, bishop a6. And I don't know why this move is played. This king going back to g1. I'm sure there's a reason for it, but Bobby is quick to put his bishop to this h3 square. If a black piece la lands on the back rank now, that's going to be checkmate. But it's okay. We have this trade of pawns over here, some trades of pieces. And this position is roughly equal according to the engine. And white should be able to hold a draw with correct play. Rook e7 check, played by Ryshevsky. Bobby moves his king over. And Ryshevsky even wins that pawn on d5, but black has compensation, probably because of the position of this bishop. White's king is weak. So rook c8 is played by Bobby, getting the rook in the action. And here Ryshevsky makes a big blunder. He goes knight to c3, letting Fisher take his knight. I think he's hoping for queen takes c3, after which queen takes h5 check will get the piece back after the king moves queen takes h3, and white is actually winning here. But Bobby does not take with the queen, he takes with the rook. And this is different because the queen remains on c2 with the possibility of capturing the rook on b1 after queen takes h5 check. Again the king moves. Now if the queen takes, guess what, you just lost a rook. So instead of taking that bishop, Ryshevsky throws in this check with the rook. I don't know what he missed in this variation. I don't know if this is the point where he missed that Bobby could just put a piece in the way to deal with that check. The rook is again under attack. If you take the bishop, you're going to lose the rook. You can take the rook, but guess what? After bishop takes c8, Bobby is just a piece up, and this is not a very difficult win. The white king is very weak. And we get a few more moves. I think the king is in danger of being checkmated here. Yeah, the computer says it's a checkmate in three. So Ryshevsky resigns, and that's a round five win for Bobby. In round six, Fisher has the white pieces. Steinmeier playing black. We have e4 and a Karakon defense. After d5, Fisher plays knight c3. I prefer e5 here. But Fisher plays knight c3, and we have the exchange of pawns in the middle. Bishop to f5, attacking the knight, which drops to g3, attacking the bishop, goes to g6. Now we have some development. Fisher plays h4, threatening to go to h5, so Steinmeier plays h6, a good move, giving the bishop a little escape square there. Bishop to d3, offering the trade of bishops, which Steinmeier takes Fisher up on. And then we have some more developing moves here. Fisher castles queenside, takes some control of the center with c4. Steinmeier castles also on the queen side. Now, it's hard to believe here that the game is going to be over in only five moves. What can go wrong for Steinmeier in five moves? Well, we're going to find out. Bishop c3 from Fisher, 
We have a check from the queen, no problem. Fisher just puts his king to b1. Now knight c5. This is where Steinmeier messes up. He decides to get tricky. Attacking white's queen, you can't take the knight or you're going to lose your queen. But this is a very dangerous thing to do. When you put one of your pieces on a square where it can potentially be captured by a pawn, all white has to do is move that queen somewhere, anywhere, and that knight now has to move. So it's kind of like a discovered check where white has a lot of options where to move and black's next move is going to be more forced because you have to get your knight out of danger. Fisher moves his queen to the best square, c2. And now Steinmeier gets his knight to e4. I guess that was the big plan. But here, Fisher has knight e5, threatening to simply take the pawn on f7 with the fork of the two rooks. And Steinmeier plays a horrible move here, which just loses immediately. Knight takes f2. Fisher just pins the knight. Now the knight's just simply going to be lost. You can't add any defense to that knight. If you try to defend it with the knight, we're just going to take that knight out and win a piece. So what would have been better here for Steinmeier? I don't know. You could take the knight here. But this also loses because after the pawn recaptures, the queen's under attack. And after you address that, we still get the fork. So maybe that's not best. Maybe knight d6, get, getting the knight out of danger and defending f7. Here the computer's saying that you can play something like rook d3. I think there are ideas of trapping the queen here. If you try to do something to get the queen out of danger, we can put the rook here and the queen goes here. And then something like c5. Yeah, we'll just drive the knight away from the defense of this pawn at the right moment, I guess, and still get the fork. So, yeah, that was a pretty quick win for Fisher. I don't think it was too difficult for him to beat this Steinmeier guy. So on to round seven. Addison playing white, Bobby Fischer playing black. And Bobby Fischer plays a sequence of moves that is not very popular. He plays his early b5 in this Rui Lopez and then attacks the bishop with the knight. This is not very popular, but Addison does not play the best response. He plays d4. Better is to make some developing move, like castle or knight c3 apparently. After d4, Bobby takes in the center. Queen captures, knight e7, and now this is still better for Addison, but he plays a bad move now. He plays c3. He wants to get that bishop out of the view of the knight, but after the knight takes the bishop, a takes b3, this c3 was just a completely wasted move. It takes away c3 from the knight, and it didn't really do anything because black just took out the bishop, so... Yeah, now Bobby's doing... Bobby actually has the advantage here, the computer says. Initially, white was the better side. And now he starts to take control in the center, expanding with these queenside pawns. Okay, hitting the bishop there, drops back. And then, look at this. Bobby Fischer playing knight to f8, the top engine move. Look at him finding top engine moves in 1964. Not an obvious move, but he wants to redeploy the knight to e6. That's his goal here. It's a better square. Okay, so g5, and he's going all out for a kingside attack. I think, does he castle queenside in this game? I don't remember. I think he does, yeah. Look at this. Look at these pawns coming forward. Black is the better side here. It's going to be difficult to defend this. Okay, so Addison plays knight to f1. d4 by Bobby. Now he's looking to get a pass pawn. So Addison does not take the pawn. He just gets his knight out of the way because he knows that g4 is coming. And it comes on the next move. He plays h4. Good move. He doesn't want files opening up towards his king. But since this knight moved, now queen c6, threatening checkmate on g2. This, the computer says knight e4 is the best defense here. And then black can castle. And then maybe c4. It's giving this line here. Um, I guess eventually maybe the idea is to put the knight in here. And if it's taken out by the bishop, then this bishop is defending a pawn on d6, perhaps? I don't know. But what's played in the game is queen to e4. Addison apparently thinks that by getting the queens off the board, it's going to be fine. This is not a problem for Bobby. He knows he has the better game. He's got this advanced pawn, which is going to be a passed pawn. In fact, it is on the very next move with c4. And then he just starts bringing his king in, and the black pieces are just too active. you got the two bishops... And so white tries to attack that pawn, it's just defended. And then he gets this knight to e4, but Bobby is quick to take that knight out. The rook takes, and the knight goes to g7, looking to jump to f5 and target this pawn here. 
So there's just too many weak pawns here. And that pawn can't be saved. He targets the knight. If the knight moves, then f7 perhaps will be taken. So defending the pawn on f7. Now the knight hops to e4, but pawn takes, pawn takes. And now we're going to target the b2 pawn. The rook defends. The rook comes in here targeting c4. Yeah, black just has too much activity. The knight has to go back to defend the pawn. And then black finally takes this pawn on h4. And then eventually is going to get another pawn. Okay, attacks the knight. Blocks, takes en passant, the knight takes, and then comes in here with check. After which the c4 pawn falls. Yeah, Bobby's just eating up too many pawns. I think that's the end of the game there. That's the resignation. Yep, another win on round seven. He's got to be feeling pretty good at this point. Round eight, Bobby Fischer with the white pieces and Weinstein with black. So we have a lot of theory to start out the game. So I won't comment too much on that, but we do get to a point where Weinstein deviates from what is more popular today. Here, most players will play queen c7, but Weinstein decides to capture on d4. This isn't very good. And then he plays bishop b7. This is another bad move. It allows d5. And that bishop, what's it ever going to do on that square now? This is all blocked up. So he says, okay, I'll just put my bishop right back to c8 because I know it's not doing anything on that diagonal now that the fishers played d5. Okay, so Bobby's getting ahead in development. Plays knight bd2, g6 here, and he kicks the knight. This is very nice. Now the knight needs to go to b7. You can go here, I guess, but then here, here, and then I think this pawn's hard to defend. This isn't good for black. So he goes to b7, a4. Fisher is striking out against the b5 pawn. He's ahead in development. He wants to attack somehow. Bishop d7 defends. Pawn takes, pawn takes. Rook takes on a8. Queen takes. And here, Fisher finds a top computer move. Rook to e3. Not an obvious move. And that's why I say if he was playing today, somebody might accuse him of using computer assistance. But this is a very nice move because it's the quickest way to get the rook over to this open a file, defended by the bishop. So the queen moves because it knows that rook a3 is coming. Queen c7 is played. Knight b3 by Bobby Fischer. Now knight to h5, maybe looking to hop into f4. Bishop d3 played. Rook c8. And here it's kind of hard to believe that white has over a three pawn advantage, according to the engine. Not super obvious, but if you look at the black pieces, I mean, what's this bishop doing? Not a whole lot, blocked by its own pawn over here. This knight has no life at all. All its good squares are taken away from it. This pawn is a big fat target, which Fisher decides to go after next with queen to f1. Knight to f6 played by Weinstein, targeting e4, so that if the bishop takes on b5, white's going to lose this pawn. But Fisher just plays bishop g5, threatening to take out that knight. Rook b8 with some indirect defense of b5. If you were to now take the knight and then try to go bishop b5, then knight c5 would be a nice discovered attack on this bishop. Fisher decides not to go down that road. He just pins this knight with rook to a7. Okay, black gets out of the pin. Now queen a1, he says, you know what? I'm not going to even go after that pawn anymore. I'm more concerned with this open file and dominating you over here. Queen to e8 played. Oh, I don't know, just adding more defense to that pawn, I guess, in anticipation of queen to a6. But now this knight is under attack. Queen c8 defends. And here Fisher has a nice tactic. Fisher plays knight takes e5. After the pawn takes... He's winning a piece on f6. Bishop takes, bishop takes, queen takes f6. So he's got an extra pawn at this point, and he's got a pass pawn, and he's got a strong attack brewing. Queen c3 played. Uh-oh, did Fisher blunder a piece? Nope, knight c5 can defend the bishop on d3. But what about knight takes c5? Oh no, b takes c5, now is the bishop going to be lost? Well, no, because this bishop is under fire. So Weinstein gets his bishop out of danger, and now bishop f1, played by Fisher. Oh, look at these two connected past pawns. That's not looking good. Weinstein's able to take one of them out, but rook e7 is now played, targeting this pawn here on e5. b4, Weinstein says, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start pushing my past pawn. Maybe it's my only hope here, but d6. Fisher's attack is more dangerous here. Queen to b6 played, pinning this pawn so it doesn't move forward, but now, unfortunately, Bishop c4 is the end of the road for Weinstein because the threat is bishop takes f7 check, which is going to end in checkmate, and Weinstein doesn't really have anything to do about that threat. There's no good defense. He 
can't put a rook here, you lose your bishop. Yeah, so that's the end of the road, and Weinstein resigns. Round nine, Bobby Fischer has the black pieces against the brother of the guy he played in the earlier round. Playing white is Donald Byrne. Earlier he played against Robert Byrne. They're both strong players. Donald plays g3, unusual opening. And Fischer plays this line with the fianchetto of the bishop on the king side. And everything's going just fine for both players. Got some normal development. And guess who goes wrong first? Burn plays g4. The computer doesn't like this move. It's not horrible. I guess he's hoping for a kingside attack. But I don't know if that's really justified for him in this position. The computer says e5 is stronger. Attack in the center. It's better. But g4, and then Bobby just decides to expand over here on the queen side. Okay, so... Black has a better position now, according to Stockfish, but it's not completely over. White has hope. Look at this active knight. Why did he allow that? I guess he wanted to shut down the opening of the file. He didn't want the pawn to take here, so he goes like this and gives black that nice square for the knight. And then he plays g5, which is kind of weird. Maybe he's hoping, still hoping for a kingside attack with eventually playing h4. But this is a bit slow. Bobby just coolly develops. Now we have knight b3 challenging that knight's position. You don't want it to stay there forever. Queen c7, okay, takes the knight out. Bishop takes with check, king moves, and now Bobby puts his bishop right back to g7. Kind of weird looking, but I guess he's figuring that white's going to play knight f3, which would hit the bishop, so he's just prophylactically dealing with that. Rook to b1. Now that's weird. So he wants to develop his dark squared bishop, but he doesn't want bishop takes b2, so he defends b2. You know, that's a kind of a sad move to make with your rook, though, taking it off the open file. Wouldn't it be better to play queen c2? I mean, that's what I would play, but what do I know? Maybe there's a problem. Computer's saying knight c6. Maybe the knight will drop in like this and hit the queen. Maybe that's the problem. I don't know. But rook to b1. Okay, so Bobby's quick to take control of that open file with rook to a8. we got bishop to e3 from burn. The rook comes in here menacingly, attacking this pawn. Queen d2 defends. I guess you don't want to go b3 because that gives the rook too much scope for attacking along this rank. So queen d2 is probably the better move. Rook to e8. Kind of a mysterious move from Bobby. I can't really profess to understand that. Okay, queen to f2. Um, let's see here. I can't say I understand all these moves. I'm not spending a lot of time on these games, though. d4 by burn. Pawn takes, bishop takes. We have this trade down. This looks kind of bad for black. A lot of times you don't want to get rid of your fianchetto bishop when it's around your king. It creates some weak dark squares over here, but Fisher knows he's going to be okay here. He plays bishop to a8 looking like maybe he wants to target this pawn. Maybe he doesn't want white to play c5 at some point. Rook a1 by burn, contesting the file. That is not the best move. The computer says just counterattack by playing something like rook f to d1, go after this pawn. After rook a1, Fisher has e5, very strong move. And now there's a little bit of a problem. The queen is not going to be able to defend everything. If you take the pawn, and then the pawn takes like this, how are you defending c4? The queen's hit. You go here, well, you're going to lose b2. You have to defend b2 as well. You know, and then the, the rook can come here and attack the queen, so you're not even defending c4 very well either. So instead of taking the pawn, burn plays queen d2, but now we have rook takes, rook takes, e takes f4, and bobby cashes in. If this pawn is taken, then of course you lose the c4 pawn. So Burn decides to just defend that pawn. Now we got knight c6. Queen takes f4. Okay. Pawn count has now equalized, but look at Fisher jumping into this nice square with his knight, attacking b3. What are you going to do about that? Well, if you're Burn, you're going to defend with the queen. Rook b1, that doesn't work so well because of this line. Knight e2 hitting the queen, and once the queen moves, we go knight c3 hitting the rook, and once the rook moves, we take the pawn here. So instead... There's queen e3 defending this pawn, but this does walk into a fork, but it's okay. Burn, he's a strong player. He knows he has queen a7, attacking the black queen. Black doesn't have time to take the rook. He takes the queen. Rook takes knight d4. Okay, pawn count is even, but now this pawn's hit, and now there is no way to defend. So, Burn counterattacks this d6 pawn. Knight takes b3. Rook takes d6. Now knight c5, 
hitting this pawn here. Rook b6, counterattacking b4. b3 is played. Pawn is defended by the knight here, so there's no rook takes pawn. King g1 is played, and I guess at that point there's no good way to defend this pawn anymore. So that pawn falls. Now Fisher's a pawn up, and he's got this very far advanced pawn, passed pawn, defended by the knight. It's not going to end well. Burn tries to get his knight back in the game. This rook comes over here. Okay, Burn attacks the knight on c5. It's okay. Fisher just pushes the pawn. You take my knight, I'm getting a queen. You don't want to allow that. So Burn takes the pawn out, but unfortunately this runs into rook a1 check. After the king moves to here, there's the knight fork. And I don't think that was preventable. Because at this point, what else are you going to do? Put the bishop in the way? Well, that just drops the knight. So yeah, and then once Fisher wins the exchange with that fork, yeah, then it's just all over with. He's able to convert his material advantage. At this point, Burn resigns. So a ninth win for Fisher in round nine. Here we go with round 10. Bobby Fisher with the white pieces. Banco playing black. Banco was a very strong player. I believe he liked to compose chess problems. Okay, so we have a Pertz defense. Not known to be the strongest opening, but you gotta hand it to Banco. He's trying to mix it up. Maybe trying to throw Bobby off with an opening that he doesn't see a lot. And he unfortunately goes wrong here though with Bishop G4. Nowadays people play Knight A6 and then they try to play C5 and contest the center. Bishop G4, I mean, what is that really accomplishing after H3? Banco just gives up the Bishop for the Knight. Not known to be great. Of course, this does allow Knight C6 with an attack on D4. It's easily defended, Bishop E3. E5 by Banco. Okay, yeah, striking in the center, it's reasonable. But Bobby takes, he takes with the correct pawn. It's a top engine move, of course, it's Bobby Fischer. And after the recapture, he plays F5, just shutting down this bishop. This pawn is on E5, blocking any activity from that bishop. And Bobby is going to attack now. Okay, so the pawn is taken. I don't think that was recommended. The computer is saying play knight to d4. <clears throat> Taking this pawn, it's not good. It just opens a file. The queen, look at the queen and the bishop. Battery. If this pawn was not there, white would have, ooh, it would be so scary for black. But Banco's probably thinking, you know, maybe I'm okay. This bishop is blocked by a pawn. I'm not going to get checkmated on h7. Or am I? We will find out. Knight d4 played. Okay, attacking the queen. Fisher just drops the queen back. Knight e8 played, looking to redeploy to d6. Bobby castles. Now the rook and the queen are looking at that f7 square. But knight d6 does defend f7. I think that was the thinking with Banco's repositioning of this knight. He wants to defend f7. Queen g3, pinning this bishop, threatening something like this perhaps. So Banco gets his king off of that file, breaks the pin. Queen g4 now from Bobby Fischer. And he's looking to move to h5 here pretty quick. c6 played by Banco because I guess he's worried about the knight coming to d5. This was not the biggest threat though. Bobby plays queen to h5, hitting this pawn, which has adequate defense. Banco decides to just add extra defense with queen to e8 and also add defense to this pawn. It feels like that's a reasonable move. Unfortunately, this is a totally losing blunder. It makes life pretty easy for Bobby, but he has to be his brilliant self in order to make the most of this situation, which he does. Bishop takes d4. And after the bishop is recaptured, he plays a brilliant move here. Actually, the only winning move, according to the computer. Another engine move by Bobby. What would you play here as white? Rook to f6 is the winning move. The whole point is you don't want f5 to come. So what Bobby wants to do here is he wants to play e5, of course, and target h7 with the bishop and the queen looking for checkmate. But here, f5 is a defense. You don't have time to take that knight because the queen will be taken. And if you take the queen, black takes with the knight. And black is okay. But after rook to f6, there will be no f5. And e5 is coming. Banco plays king to g8. Now e5. He plays h6. Okay, so he stopped the checkmate. But remember, this knight is under attack. And Fisher plays knight to e2. And at this point, Banco resigns. Because if you move that knight somewhere, let's say you go to here, guess what? Queen to f5. That knight was defending the f5 square. How are you stopping? Queen h7 mate. So, 
Another brilliant performance by Bobby in round 10. Okay, here we go with the final round for Bobby. Round 11. Bobby Fischer has the black pieces. Sadie is playing white. We have an English opening. And both players play this pretty well. So I'm not going to comment on too much because the game isn't really decided until the end game. I'm going to get to a key situation here, though, where we have knight to d4 by Sadie. Bobby takes the knight out, and then he gives Sadie a weak pawn here. But Sadie does have the bishop pair. Bobby gets to take over this file with his rook. Okay, bishop d1, preventing the rook from coming in here to c2. Bobby wisely trades off a pair of bishops. It's what you want to do when your opponent has the bishop pair. Then he infiltrates with his rook. It's okay, though. Sadie can guard that b2 pawn with rook d2. And then we have a trade of rooks and another trade of rooks. And okay, here we go. We, ha we have an endgame where it's knight versus bishop, and the pawn structure is symmetrical. Will Bobby be able to win with his knight? Is the knight better? Yes, it is. It's a bit better. White may be able to hold this position with perfect play, but the pawns for the moment are on the wrong color. If you have the dark squared bishop, you want your pawns on the light squares. This pawn is a big target right now, but maybe white can hold. Let's see what happens. Kings are moving towards the middle. Not sure why the king moves to e2 here, um, but we have some repositioning of the pieces, some back and forth with the knight. And I'm going to go to the moment where Sadie really starts to go wrong. The engine says that Fisher has an advantage here, but then the advantage kind of dissipates. He's better here. Yeah, right here it says it's dead even. After these, this pawn trade here and this, Sadie can hold this position by playing king to e2. That's the correct defense. He should play king e2. You can't save this pawn, but after knight takes g4, now you drop your bishop to g1. And the bishop is going to guard h2. It's guarding your pawn. You're going to be able to put your king to f3. This is the best way to hold the position for white. If you look at the difference with what Sadie played, though, he played bishop to e1 here. And now the knight takes. It's a little different. Then he goes to d2, targeting this pawn. This is just losing. And this is a pretty complicated endgame. I'm not going to pretend to understand all of these moves. But I do know that at this point, bishop e1 is played. And then the knight goes to f6. And bishop h4, hitting the knight, the knight goes to e4. There was some point where if the king tried to come over here and defend, there was some line where knight h2 check was significant because it pushes the king away from f3. At some point, white wanted to go f3 to stop the black king from infiltrating, but then there was knight h2 check, which would not be possible if the bishop was on g1. So just FYI about that. But let's see how the game ended anyway. We have some repositioning of the pieces. The engine says white is totally lost here. The knight gets to come to this e4 square. Okay, the bishop goes to e1. We end up with knight g3 check. And here the king goes to d3. Knight f5, and this pawn ends up falling is what happens. Because white cannot hang on to both this pawn. He ended up over here with this king to defend this pawn, I guess. Because the bishop wanted to be here to defend against the king coming in or something. Bishop f2 is played here. Okay, but then the, this pawn's targeted by the knight. So now there's just really no hope. You can't defend that pawn. And Bobby ends up winning the pawn, and then at this point he's a pawn up with the active king and knight. And it's all over with because this pawn starts to move forward. And that's where Sadie resigned. So that's it. Bobby Fischer retains the title with a perfect score. The only time it's ever happened in U.S. history. And there's actually something called the Fisher Prize. And you can look that up if you want to. I actually don't even remember what the prize is. But if anyone wins the U.S. championship with a perfect score, they get the Fisher Prize. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Subscribe to the channel for more videos coming soon. All chess related and all very interesting.